What I cherish the most when I hear a pianist play is their sense of style. In a way, the capacity of theirs to demonstrate good taste, which is not that subjective when you study a time period of music and you realize that there are certain um, ways to uh, bring out the philosophical storytelling that the music communicates to us directly without syllables, without lyrics. <clears throat> and I find that um, the technique which is always spoke about in some abstract term, the technique, starts with the control of the touch for very simple and very basic elements of harmonic progressions that bring the sense of tension and release, of delayed arrival on the tonic by other cadences like the deceptive or plagal, etc. <clears throat> In other words, what I find very interesting is when I find that the student plays intuitively the right way of playing instruments which were not existing when this music was written. Naturally, it's natural to think that the composers who composed those pieces did not get um, stopped by whatever their instrument, the keyboard instrument they had, um, was capable of producing. I don't think it was a race between a composer being avant-garde ahead and the instrument being um, sort of keeping the composer backwards into not um, daydreaming things that couldn't be told in the length of sound, in the articulation, in the speed of lifting of the keys for the pianofortes after the harpsichords. <clears throat> it's a common thought, oh, if Beethoven comes today, he would love the instrument better. Because we feel like the modernity or the progress was enhancing the dynamic range and the length of the piano that can project in a hall of 2,000 people without loudspeakers. Though again, the social cultural development of music sharing seems to always gone, have gone into the greater numbers, reaching vast audiences in a single time when the recording industry brought the capacity to reach each listener individually. Of course, to the detriment of the unbelievable uh, shared <coughs> situation of a living concert, the audience is not passive, the performers are active, there is a sense of exchange, expectation, possibly disappointment, but hopefully something ignites in the energy of making the music in front of the audience rather than cooking it away and editing it so that it can sound as politically correct, clean as possible in every aspect, not only the false notes but also the false thoughts. And if you think that uh, you want to be liked by a larger denominator, then you take less, less of the self-involved uh, decisions about the interpretation. I still think that one has to take the risk to be um, honest about what they believe in the piece, regardless of how others think of the piece. But the reason for which I find that very striking for the style, as I said in the beginning, is because when a recital is played by a pianist with at least three contrasting styles, very often you hear just a piano playing. 
you don't hear the piano transforming its um, sound palette through the touch control, which is what I think is the basis of the piano technique beyond only velocity, also, but not only equality of fingers, but also because you need to play them uneven if you bring out melodic lines over others. If you don't want to play a combination of secondary voices with the melody in the same right hand, for instance. So the velocity, the virtuosity is acceptable for the effects um, of uh, the driven emotion. Then they become effects. Uh, the effect would be the expression, the um, projectura, the accacciatura, the, um, the, the grace notes in both cases or in suspension. When you create those delayed resolutions where you manipulate the psychology of the listener by delaying the ways and the times when you uh, go to the release from the tension. And this way you have a consistent overlapping of tensions that release at different moments of the layering. So no matter how complex the texture can be, or how simple it is, if it's a, a, an imitation of the voice on the piano with an accompaniment of an arpeggio, I think in both cases the texture is um, something that we read through the notation, but then we have to be readable through the interpretation to the listeners who don't have the score or don't need to have the score in case they don't know how to read it. So you don't just read it for them or recite the publisher or try to play as everybody else is acceptable for the tempo of raising articulation pedaling and so people will expect something they receive which is sort of a midway between um, trying to be politically correct and not at the same time too uninvolved because you're afraid if you have some drastic um, appealing and really, uh, um, I think, um, sparkling ideas that initiate an excitement, um, not specifically only by the furioso uh, capacity of playing very, very great virtuosity, but also <clears throat> the capacity to, to shape the innuendos in the pianissimi and the mezzo pianissimi in the inner voices. In other words, I find myself very much driven by performers who bring the inner life of the piece, while the piece itself exists anyway. And if um, some people are easily criticizing others because their personal tastes are not met in the interpretation of somebody else, so what? It's not like there is a single truth. As I said, stylistically, at an individual level, when I hear somebody play, I can determine if they make a um, definite choice of dynamic range, of uh, voicing, of bringing out or holding back voices and instrumental innuendos for other instruments. And so, in other words, they, they colorize and they... Um, blossom the texture with um, rich levels of choices in the um, foreground and the background of the elements. So you don't hear just everything loud, everything soft, but you hear a flow of events of whom some are melodic, could be in both bass line and soprano line or top line, because those are the easiest one to follow when you don't have a score. And then without too much pedal smearing to hear the articulation of the inside um, of the harmonization of the moving elements. And of course, I know that people have these definite uh, opinions about what is the right tempo for this piece compared to what's wrong. And I think that to have a definite opinion by analytical uh, or um, experimental situation through life can bring you to, to that. But as a listener, you can also start having um, um, driven um, 
selective admirations for certain performers who you think bring you the piece with more juice, with more life, with more meaning, and you feel even physically when you watch them that they really are in the piece, they are becoming the text they are narrating. Uh, beyond reciting it, it becomes believable. It's like they own it during this moment where you share it with the audience. And the audience, in fact, is very um, at different levels of uh, perception. The melody, perhaps the pulse, perhaps the harmonization, but that is a lot more sophisticated to um, follow in terms of modulations or secondary dominance and ultimately one can say in a live performance what does it matter if you modulate in this key or you're only in secondary dominance within the principal key it's more about uh, proportions and analytical um, vision of the piece on paper but when it's only the ears you have to play it with the intuition that drove you in the first place as, as well as with the analysis and understanding how you're going to deal with the grace notes on the beat or before the beat and not always and not every time and how do you do the semitones compared to the full tones how do you define what is consonant and dissonant in the way you highlight it either because it is a lament either because it's a comic effect um, all these elements taken individually are not part of the characterization of the piece. It's only when you put it together all in traction and in flow and in direction that you're taken by the elements like on a track on which you place a train in your going through different um, and interestingly changing landscapes or weather changes and you are idle but the action is changing in front of your eyes and when you're active yourself and that is often in the allegro prestos or the driven sections where you have a lot of action then in a way you observe much less you're more taken by the pleasure or the drive of um, being enticing and when you're um, in a situation where you're observing rather than um, active where you're um, just enjoying the situation even if the situation is not changing much um, especially if there are repeats, especially if there is a restatement of the melodic or thematic leitmotif material. So yes, you can say that there are sections in music where you are more an um, active action definer of the mood and uh, you have to take everybody with you like a conductor giving the upbeat and the orchestra follows and then the conductor is always a bit ahead and the orchestra follows and there is a sense of energy between these two um, one pulling the other ones running towards the person who pulls and um, then you have these moments of um, just um, observation of things where um, like after recitativo in opera where the action moves you have the aria where the mood is stated after the action and so you have this uh, slower movements or second themes if the first was driven which are more reflective more um, beautifully um, beyond contrasting um, they have their own um, ecosystem if you play something slower you have to know about the decay of the sound that you have to observe even if you dream it or imagine it in your musicianship vibrating or crescendo which you cannot do on the piano and find a tempo that allows to stretch without to drop because then the next note after a dropped um, sound will be an accent be it on will unwillingly or even willingly sometimes because of the summary indications on the scores you have a sforzando somewhere you don't expect in Beethoven or accents in Liszt and but 
there are many notes that don't have written definition of articulation or, or striking effect. So what do you play with them? Nothing? Neutral? There is no neutral. Well, perhaps in this um, contemplative mode of observing, there is a certain um, neutrality in order to um, let the little innuendos, the, the shivers of the instant um, of the musical, sometimes detailed uh, changes to appear instead of being covered by pedal and Basically, the pedal is the greatest help and worst enemy uh, while feeling so friendly because it's reassuring to, to smear a little bit if you're not very sure of the fingers um, being able to play the section convincingly. It's almost like purchasing an insurance with the pedal. But then sometimes you don't need it because you've practiced enough without pedal to know how to play the section. But then comes the perception of the acoustic compared to the practice place, compared to the performance place. And then all of a sudden the resonance is big, your pedal is too much, but it's difficult to <laughs> change one element of your um, cognitive mnemotechnic knowledge of the section. In a way, um, after you learn its separate hands and separate layers, sing and play, organize, change directions, uh, sing one, play the other, or just speak one and play the other, you reach point where um, somehow it's like um, autopilot. The fingers play, the pedals push mostly on harmonic changes, which doesn't always correspond to the melodic line, and therefore half pedals are better, if possibly even shivering pedals, so that while not dry, it doesn't get drawn, but is some kind of moist, or some kind of um, um, mildly wet, so that you can have, in fact, benefit for the length of the sound of a given note, it would be on the top or in the middle or the bottom. Of course, in the bottom they resonate longer than the top on the piano. But you don't choose when you play somebody's piece because you have to play where they wrote the note, with the dynamic that they ask for it, regardless of the action of the piano. If it's well um, regulated or even when it is, the lower notes are heavier to play. And if you have to play them very soft according to the composer's wish, then you have to find ways to avoid the hole or the fear it won't speak. So when you get back to this essential di dimension of basic dealing with the unexpected, that you practice over and over to reassure yourself that you know it, because by repeating, you delegate a lot to your uh, muscular memory. And um, of course, it's on the same instrument, but when you change instrument, the very uh, synergy of the reaction with the instrument and yourself for what you project in your inner hearing and what you receive from what you produce, there is sometimes such gap that you feel like, oh no, I don't like it, or I should continue, but I don't know what I'm doing, it doesn't sound like usual, or it reveals itself differently because all of a sudden I hear things I didn't hear in the piece when I practiced it, either by the accurate amount of more um, intense hearing capacity, because you're in the production of the moment, in, in the osmosis with the audience, or at least in a, in a communion with the audience, so it's you know you're not practicing, and they know that you're trying to bring the best of what you practiced. And ultimately, the one-time concert performance that is so uh, nerve-making um, or um, bringing most of the artists to have what they call stage fright, which I've never experienced, not because I'm abnormal, but because I don't... Um, I think my perfect pitch helped me avoid it. But it could be that it's another reason. It could be the, the sheer joy to share a beautiful music with an audience that is more meaningful than the fear of not doing it well. Or betraying it. Or making a fool of oneself. Because you take that risk when you have a one time through. 
And that one time through has to be the sum of all the preparation about the different elements that bring you to play that piece the way you do. The in innate, the learned, the practiced, the memorized, the settled in a situation where you think it's solid but in fact you realize it's not because you're more vulnerable when you're positioning yourself in front of the audience in a piano that you haven't played often, if not almost ever. So you don't want to feel the piano as an enemy biting you, nor the audience as critics who will um, dislike your playing of the piece, if they know the piece or even without. Sometimes the charisma of the performer overtakes um, stylistic boundaries, I must say, against my grain, but it is a fact. And I think um, nobody teaches charisma. Uh, you teach how to play clean. The right fingering, the right gesture, the right anticipation of the gesture that allows you to secure the shifting or the jump or the whatever it's demanded on the topography of the keyboard. And so that you become more, let's say, confident rather than overconfident. And that when the inevitable finger goes to the wrong key or in between two keys, whichever reasons you deal with it very swiftly because you've practiced so many times that at best you just go forward don't try to fix it on the moment because that's not the point of the performance performance is to state the whole piece besides the sum of the excerpts of the um, um, sections that you learned because the whole piece is not a sum of the sections a whole piece is a path, like a lifetime uh, experience of something um, for which you prepared, but which reveals itself different at the very crucial moment when it's happening. And instead of being discouraged and say, oh, I practiced all for that and still messed up this section, I think it's important to find, or the teacher through the practicing, um, has to establish, and I believe very strongly, that practicing ethics. Because it's not just repeat until you know it, or until you get numb or have a tendinitis because repetitivity is exhausting. Because it's all about remaining in the brain through the fingers input uh, from the ear monitoring. And so you have this kind of conductor orchestra rehearsal between yourself and the piece and your cognitive capacities to play it in that tempo or this tempo with this or that ornaments or this or that phrasing, this or that amount of staccato, wet staccato, non legato, but really legato or sometimes even over legato. So you make those choices and then you try to organize them so that they can play through the piece. And very often when there are different sections in a long one movement piece, the problem is that most of us adjust as we go into the new section, I speak of the technique. Even if we have a stylistic clarity about it in front of our eyes, I want it this way, you play it and it doesn't come out the way you want it or you wanted it in your inner you. So then you have to deal with the unexpected and make sense of it because you're not going to stop and you're not going to start again. It's once it is, it is. And then you have to um, um, structurize um, perhaps the rests a little bit longer, perhaps the breathing more than the rhythm, in order to um, organize. Uh, it's always an anticipation of touch, preparation, anticipation of elbow, shoulder, especially wrist and then palm and support and, and type of articulation. So at some point you might have a lower attention level, either because the concentration intensity is hard to hold for so long, or because you played too much with autopilot and you take things back in hand, so to say, <laughs> pun unintended, and, um, and then you find out that you can get out of this trap by a different way and then you continue because it's always in front of you until the interrupted silence of the beginning is followed by the interrupted music into the silence and hopefully applause if the audience is there and happy. But um, you don't play for the applause and you don't play to be right or wrong. 
you try to be that. You try to be informed and, and inspired and um, make sure that you bring in in your playing the richnesses of the texture because the teacher either showed it or you heard it in others or by yourself when you read the music and you realize that it doesn't always correspond to what you usually hear because the texture and the rending, rendering doesn't always match. All these are elements of um, how you organize what you want to say. And that's why the style matters so much. If you play a Baroque piece or a Romantic era piece or a classical era, inter-Romantic era, because not all the eras inevitably are not clearly separated and uh, defined. They overlap and some overstay, some go look backwards, some are more avant-garde. But generally, you have an idea that a forte in Mozart cannot be the forte in Tchaikovsky. Or a piano in Scarlatti or pianissimo wouldn't be the same pianissimo as in uh, Chopin. Why? Even if it sounds, even if it's the tonal system, all this basic things in common in the language that they all use, but they, the composers, I mean, um, until atonalism, early 20th century, um, they all um, managed to um, make their music very personal with the language of all of them, because the tonal system is an international language, and so What makes the difference of the dynamic range or the touch capacity of the pedaling between a melodic line in Chopin or in Scarlatti, it's obvious to most, not really as well as ever it should be because a lot of elements come in account between the wish and the will and, and the how. That's where the teacher comes, I think, to find ways to make the student express to the extreme of their understanding or loving, or both, and sometimes not always, um, a given section, a given uh, factor in the piece. And of course, you can think that the whole is just a series of details, but it's not true. You have to be precise in the details, but they have to be integrated in the whole. So that's once you learn the piece, you don't go through the obstacle course as if it could be imagined for. No, you go through a blossoming section that brings another one, either by surprise, either by uh, bridge. And very often these transitions are the hardest things to do in interpretation because sometimes they're not as striking for, by essence as the melodic uh, thematic materials that take your heart. But you have to be not making them more meaningful than they are. You just have to integrate them so that you can merge in the next traffic if you change um, lanes or highway. Whatever my uh, um, comparisons are valid for or not, I feel always that there is a sense of traction, of movement, and that your ritenuto shouldn't be under the new tempo, even if it's slower tempo, because you don't want to stop and start, basically. You want to just flow into it. And so that's why it's important, once you learn a piece through the details and the uh, sections, to play it throughout. And then you realize how ill-prepared you arrive in some sections and you regret it because you don't have sometimes, and most of the time actually, the time to adjust to <laughs> enter in the new section and keep adjusting because by the time you have the right mnemotechnic approach, whoops, it's the next one. And it's like sometimes you run behind the sections because you're constantly disappointed perhaps of how you didn't do as well as you should have hoped to or terribly badly um, the preceding section. And sometimes you drive, but you look at the rear, mirror, rear, rear um, view mirror, sorry. Because you have to monitor as well that as the traction of the piece, but therefore always ahead like the conducting beating ahead and the orchestra following. And I think that once uh, with the teacher or perhaps with your own um, comparisons of other interpretations and reading some articles, whatever it takes in the mix, you as a young artist choose to do it in one specific way that means to you, regardless if you're going to perhaps change mind later in life. But at one point you have to lock it in 
You have to be reliable with your technique to restate it, not always expecting to be like you planned, but sometimes there is good things in the unexpected. All of a sudden the piece turns out in a certain tempo with some resonance of some acoustic and your moments of uh, psychological awareness, perhaps in fact the piece really reveals itself to you when you play it for somebody, from one to many, other than for yourself or the recording device, because that is more uh, a closed circle whenever and you bring somebody knowledgeable of the piece or not of course that's a different way of listening but nevertheless that's when the piece starts living with you and that's when you realize how you can define the stylistic um, elements um, of uh, Schubert compared to Rachmaninoff or Mozart compared to Stravinsky I mean, it's obvious when we say it because we know music, but the style is, I think, the definition of the good taste. And you can disagree with each other and say, oh, I thought stylistically that was great, or somebody can say next to you, no, my God, that was terrible, it's not supposed to be like that. And you can say, I, I don't know, but I was convinced, and if I play it, or I did play it, I might have played it, or might play it differently, but I can receive the alterity as a welcome. Um, it's not that there is really an infinite number of um, opportunities to play differently the piece, it's just that every human being brings their own um, vibration, their own heartbeat, so to say, to the piece. It's not as immediate as a voice of a singer because that is the organic expression of one's body literally and we go through the action on the piano so but we still recognize some pianists even without video if we are aware of how they touch organize articulate express the music even in different styles or sometimes we're surprised actually because we think oh I like this performer for Bach and this performer for Chopin and this other performer for Rachmaninoff good that makes uh, you have as a listener um, a very educated taste and uh, then you can change mind obviously but um, with some argumentation I mean um, is it socio-historic for how it was in your opinion played then or how it means today and um, it's a vastitude of things that, in fact, nourish and um, the immersion of the young artist in the piece while shared. And putting oneself in danger because for two or three sections that were good, perhaps five or six weren't as good, and then at the end you were always disappointed as a performer, even if people cheer you after the performance, man, it was good, great, nobody heard it, or great, and I loved it, nobody plays it as slow, nobody plays it as fast, it's so exciting. Perhaps to a certain extent, there is the mix between your charisma and the piece, and how you display the piece according to your capacity of extracting the sound even through the action to be so personal and not impersonal, therefore stylistic, therefore cultivated with a certain sense of exact culture of what you want and what you don't want. You have to make choices. Which dynamics, which layering, which ways of coating it in your um, culture and intelligence and then of course with the years experience which is part of the mix.